So we will use now the example of Indian continental drift as a way of understanding how geology affects the configuration that we see now has affected it and how climate was changed because of it and how biology responded to the changes in climate and in fact the change in biology then affected climate as well. So here is a figure that's showing India south of the equator about 70 million years ago and it has slowly drifted as shown by the times on the map 58, 49, 35 and so on. So zero is the present period and we know as I said in the other lecture we know that India was south of the equator by looking at certain rocks and we look at the magnetic lines on it. So if you think of a magnet it has a north pole and a south pole. The lines of magnetic field that connect the two poles tend to have a very high angle at the two poles and the angle of the line is fairly low at in the middle of the magnet. So if the rock that you find and you look at its magnetic field, if the angle is low that means the rock was at a low latitude. If it has high angle magnetic lines that means it was at a higher latitude, right? Because the north pole is at high latitude and south pole is at high latitude. So you need to locate, geolocate the rock that you found by using magnetic lines and then you need to find out when it was at that latitude. For that you use certain radioactive isotopes like lead, uranium uh, and so on which have very long half life like a billion years. So that allows you to say how long ago India was at that given location as determined by the magnetic lines. So as the continental drift happened and India crashed into Asia that existed at the time, it did not subduct, it only partially subducted and started pushing up the Asian continent. So you created this huge Himalayan mountains that we see now. So all the matter that was there, young rock and so on, got exposed as mountains and as the mountains formed and the circulation of the atmosphere began to change. You also created a change in heat capacity between land and ocean, right? Because the heat capacity of the ocean is much higher than that of land, which means when the sun comes overhead, the ocean heats up much, much slower than land. Whereas the land has a very low heat capacity, as sun comes overhead it heats up very fast, right? So as the continent settled into this configuration about 10 million years ago, whenever northern summer happened and the sun came overhead, continent would heat up very fast which makes it less pressure. So if a warm surface will have lower pressure in the atmosphere above, whereas the ocean is heating up much slower, so its temperature is lower, so its pressure is higher. If you have high pressure here and low pressure here, then the wind wants to go from high pressure to low pressure. But as we learned in the Coriolis effect, in the southern hemisphere, the wind will be pushed to the left of the direction in which it wants to go. And once it crosses the equator, it will be pushed to the right of the direction it wants to go. So if we look at it more carefully from the high pressure to the low pressure, basically we will have winds coming from the southwest onto the land. So remember the Indian Ocean is still very warm. We will see the sea surface temperature maps in the other modules. So when you have wind and you have warm temperatures, you have evaporation. So lots of moisture is being brought in by these winds onto the continent which is what giving us the monsoons during the summer season. There is another monsoon during the winter season which we will not worry about here. So we will see in a little bit that this setting up of the Himalayas, the Indian subcontinent close to the equator and the heat capacity differences in land and ocean changed the climate completely and created this monsoon season which began to affect the kind of vegetation that began to grow on 
African continent, over India and also at the rest of the world's continents. And the Himalayan mountain that got formed, as I said, it raised a lot of material with it. With the huge amount of rain coming, there was a lot of weathering. All that material began to get washed out. So even now, the rivers that come into the Bay of Bengal, like Ganga, Brahmaputra, Mahanadi, Krishna, etc., they still bring lots of sediments into it. The rivers that come from the Himalayas, like Ganga and Brahmaputra, carry some of the highest sediments in the whole world. What, why is that important? Because when you have such weathering and you take it away into the ocean, the weathering is basically dissolving the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the rain and that carbon dioxide is being put away into the ocean. So the, over the time that the Himalayas formed and the monsoons formed, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been decreasing. This decrease in carbon dioxide affected the vegetation and we will see that in another module. So here is a clear example of how geology affected the mountain formation, that affected the circulation, that affected the rainfall and that in, in turn affected the vegetation types. Of course, when vegetation grows, then that also affects carbon dioxide, in turn will affect the greenhouse effect and the circulation of the atmosphere as we will see later on. Thank you.